Today for our Christmas service we are going to be in a very untraditional and unorthodox section of scripture. And today it will be in Matthew chapter 2 and we're going to go verses 16 through 18. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. If you will pray with me, now Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations deep within all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 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 I know. I know. It's Christmas, and many of you were expecting a more traditional type of sermon. But... What I have prepared today for you will bring more peace, love, and hope to your Christmas. I know that the visual of babies being slaughtered is not very Christmas-like, and I agree with you. But again, stay with me here. While most Christmas time sermons are intended to warm your heart and be very non-offensive, to soothe the conscience of those who attend services at Christmas and Easter only. This sermon will deliver to the ones who believe enough in the Lord Jesus Christ a different warming of your heart in a new way and bring you great joy. Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. A baby sleeping in a manger as three wise men bring gifts from a faraway land to worship the newly born king. Camels and donkeys, shining stars and ringing bells. And these are all very comforting images from the Christmas story we've all been shown throughout our lives. But was this truly with the beginning of what we now call Christmas all about? Today will be similar to other days and earlier when we close our eyes and we go back in time to put the birth of the Savior into perspective, putting ourselves there in that time and place. But I'm going to tell you ahead of time, it will not be the same as what you've been taught in the images that you now associate with Christmas. It won't be anything close to the world's rendition of the Christmas story with jolly elves wrapping presents at the North Pole for Santa, for him and his reindeer to deliver to all the good little boys and girls. What this will be is the events that were transpiring around the birth of the Savior, the fallout from his birth, and then we will look. We will look at what is no longer a newborn king's kingdom. But rather, we're going to look at what the king's kingdom is looks like now. From the date of his immaculate conception, Jesus Christ had the cross on Calvary's hill looming in his future. The cross was not an if but a when situation. It was going to happen. This is why the Savior was born. As an overview to the account of the life of Jesus, after his birth, the baby Jesus would grow. He would grow into the perfect sinless sacrifice. He would minister to the lost, and then when the time was right, Jesus Christ would go to the cross. There upon that cross, Jesus Christ would die a substitutionary death upon the cross, dying in the place of those who repented and placed their hope in him, in Jesus Christ. The ultimate sacrifice for sin. After his death, Jesus was placed into the tomb, a stone placed in front of the opening of the tomb and sealed guards placed at the now sealed door. Three days later there was an empty tomb. The sealed and guarded stone rolled away. The body of the Messiah resurrected. 
Jesus would appear to many in the next 40 days, resurrected and whole, finally ascending into heaven. The Holy Spirit descending to be with us, the believers here on earth. The same Holy Spirit we now have in this room and here with us today. Yes, that little baby, that little baby in the manger, like all babies, grew and became an adult with a reason for his life. Thankfully, this little baby, while growing, like other babies, was far from being like other babies. From the moment Jesus was born, his life was in jeopardy. As we read early in the second chapter of Matthew, once the baby, Messiah, was born, there was sin enough, sign enough that the Magi, also known as the wise men, knew the king of the Jews had been born. When the sign came, when the sign came, the Magi set out on a journey that would bring them to the king. Now paintings and many church accounts set the number of Magi at three, giving us the idea of three elderly men with long white beards walking across the desert with gifts to bestow upon the young king. Scripturally, there is not a number given of how many Magi came from afar. It could have been three, as is traditionally thought, and this is because of the three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh that was bought, brought to Jesus. But there were probably more. These magi that came were priests and expert in mysteries from Persia and Babylon. At this time, the term magi would refer to a wide range of men who were involved in astrology, the interpretation of dreams, they studied sacred writings, studied magic, and they perused wisdom. These men would have been very familiar with Old Testament prophecy due to their interaction with the Jews in Babylon. The Jews felt that the prophecy from Numbers 24, 17, which reads, A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, was pointing to the coming Messiah, and the Magi would have heard this as well. So, when the star rose, they began their journey. The Magi would transverse some 800 miles to get to the baby Jesus, an 800-mile journey that wouldn't be traveled alone. They undoubtedly would have had a huge caravan of people, animals, and supplies. Attendants and guards, all the provisions for the journey to and back from the newborn king, with these supplies loaded on pack animals hauling them across the sand. As you have probably visualized now, this was not three old men going around the corner to drop off a few gifts. This was a massive parade of man and beast marching toward Jerusalem. If we look at their trip being over 800 miles, at 20 miles a day, which is a long ways to walk and very aggressive walking for 20 miles in a day, the journey would have taken approximately 40 days to complete from where the Magi were to where the baby Jesus lay. From many higher places in Jerusalem, the dust and massive parade of flesh would have garnered a lot of attention. They could have literally seen these people coming for a while. What was this parade and why was it headed for Jerusalem would be the question on all of their minds. When the Magi arrived, it would be them announcing the birth of the king to King Herod with a question. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now this would have come as a complete and total shock to Herod, who was the appointed king of the Jews by the authority of Rome. Herod was a master builder and a very firm ruler and was at times very ruthless. So this news of a newborn king did not set well with him as he saw this as an attempt at overtaking his kingdom and his authority, and this set him off. Herod had been known during his more ruthless times to have murdered his own wife, several of his sons, and some of his other relatives. 
when Herod wasn't being a cold-blooded killer, he would use his building skills to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem, theaters, fortresses, cities, and palaces. He would also finance structures, including pagan temples throughout the Roman Empire. Herod had protected and established his kingdom, so you can see why he would be greatly troubled by the news that one was born that had come to take his place. Yet, it wasn't just Herod that was troubled. As scripture tells us, when Herod, the king, heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. All Jerusalem was troubled as well, that this new king was born. But why? Simply put, a new king brings new rules. Jesus would upset Herod's throne. But he would also upset the livelihood of the corrupt religious and political leaders of Jerusalem. They were all living lives that they enjoyed and they were profiting from them. When this massive parade arrives and tells them that their lives are going to change. Your lives are going to change because there's a new king in town. Life was going to change for the wicked and corrupt people in Jerusalem unless unless they snuffed out the flame of this new king. So, as any corrupt person would do, Herod summoned the Magi and asked them where this child was. Herod instructed the Magi that once they found the Christ child to come back and tell him, tell Herod, where the baby could be found, so, surprise, he too could go and worship him. Herod had every intention of preserving his kingdom and keeping his evil, corrupt deeds hidden. He would never, he would never worship the child, but he would lie and he would connive to keep all that he had built under his control. Knowing about this plot, God warned the Magi in a dream. So they would take a different route home that wouldn't go back anywhere close to Herod. During this time, Herod sat and waited for the Magi to return, to give him the exact location, the exact location of where the Christ child was, so Herod could then go and have Jesus killed and end all these threats to his kingdom and his lifestyle. But when Herod finally realized he'd been tricked by the Magi, as we've seen how he was and is, he was mad to the point of ferocity. He was so mad that he sent his men into the kingdom to kill all the male children two years old and under. See, two years old was the approximate age that Herod figured Jesus was at this point by his talks with the Magi. So now we're two years past the birth of the baby Jesus. Similarly, as with the Magi, Joseph was warned in a dream that Herod was going to try to assassinate the Christ child. Joseph did as he was instructed in the dream, and he fled to Egypt and out of harm's way. And this concluded the first of many attempts on the life of Jesus Christ before he could make it to the cross, which, if any of these attempts were successful, it would have effectively, effectively ended Christianity as we know it. Many attempts were made to end Jesus' life throughout the Gospels. Attempts that, if successful, would end the life and ministry of Jesus long before he was ever nailed upon the cross. Even Satan himself got personally involved in the task of ending Jesus when Satan tempted Jesus to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple in Luke 4.9. If you are the Son of God, Satan would say to Jesus, throw yourself down from here. The ultimate victory against God and Jesus Christ was thought to be won as Jesus hung from the cross and said, it is finished. Finally, the world and the forces of evil were rid of Jesus Christ. A three and a half decade long battle was over. Upon the cross, 
blood running down its main beam, hung the dead body of the Christ, soon to be dead and buried. Dead, buried, and gone. His disciples, his closest friends, would flee into hiding. It is finished, they would also say. In order to stop the masquerade from continuing, the Romans placed soldiers at the entrance of the tomb. No one is going to steal his body and allow this farce to continue. The Romans and the Pharisees, working together, would be sure of that. The Gospels in unison tell us that three days later, the stone that sealed the tomb was rolled away, and the guarded sealed tomb was viewed empty. A story was contrived to explain it all away. He has not indeed risen. It was his friends. His friends come and took his body. They, it is they, they are the ones that are behind this. <clears throat> Three days later, the truth is revealed in the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Forty days later, Jesus would ascend to heaven and the Holy Spirit would fall, ushering in the church. Christianity would spread the world over as people were being made alive in the spirit at an alarming rate. What was just a small issue when Jesus was alive had now become a major issue. Christianity was taking this world by storm. There was no choice in the matter at all, decided those that opposed Christianity. These followers of his must follow their leader to the grave. And so persecution against the church began. First, Stephen was stoned. That would stop this madness, they thought. It did not. In fact, when one Christian was killed, two, three, four more would rise up. Christianity was continuing to grow at an alarming rate despite this persecution. Twofold, threefold growth alarmed those who opposed it. The only thing they could think to do was continue to kill them until this madness subsided. Little did they know that this persecution against the church wouldn't need to last a few years, but centuries, up to the point that it is still going on today. All of Jesus Christ's disciples were included in those martyrs, all of them except John. But in John's case, it wasn't for lack of trying because they, the world tried to martyr John as well. Countless Christians down through the sands of time have entered into their holy reward due to martyrdom. And here is the point of this message. Did all of these people die for a newborn baby swaddled in a manger? Did they die for one born king or the one that is on the throne? The world found the Christians multiplying so quickly they couldn't kill them all, so they changed the message. No longer would we be focused on Jesus Christ, King of the Jews, risen Savior. The world would turn the focus over to a jolly obese man in a red suit with a shop full of elves making toys for good children, turning the world away from Jesus Christ in a more cunning, sinister, and diabolical way. Decorated trees, lights, and snow were added into the mix to make the time of year more festive, and it worked. People's attention was diverted away from the Savior and onto themselves. People began to add fuel to the already sin-filled lives they were living. Love God seemed to remain somewhat intact, but love thy neighbor as thyself is blown from the water like it was hit by an artillery round from a modern-day warship. Family issues take center stage as Uncle Bush ha Butch has to rehash decades-old arguments. Perfect, loving gifts for others are rationalized away by the thoughts of why spend this much on them, they never spend that on me, and in some cases, money allotted for others is spent on self due to the deep, deep price cuts found this time of the year. This year, and every year following, I propose this. We leave the world and their sin-riddled festivities behind. Let's celebrate the birth of the Lord in a new way. 
not by idolizing a newborn infant, but in worship to the king that is here, that is here now. Leave the happy holidays and season's greetings to those outside of Christ. Wish one another a Merry Christmas. In a world that is swaying away from Christ, as we can see now, the simple greeting of Merry Christmas makes you more of an outlaw than Jesse James, John Dillinger, and Al Capone combined. I say let Uncle Butch be Uncle Butch. Just pay no attention to him. Don't let him wreck the birthday of the Savior for you. If you see a gift you know another would enjoy, buy it for them. Don't worry about how much they would spend on you. If you see something you've been looking for at a great price, buy it. Just don't let greed get the best of you. Enjoy the many great things the Savior's birthday gives to us all. God, family, friends. This sermon and the events that led up to it came to me almost a decade ago. The Christmas message with Christ Jesus lying in the manger makes many people feel warm and fuzzy inside. But to me, I saw it as a world trying to portray Jesus as a weak, powerless infant, unable to feed, clothe, or protect himself. A weak vessel in a weakened state that could be destroyed at any second. When in reality, today, the exact opposite is true. When John saw Jesus in heaven in Revelation, he fell at Jesus' feet like a dead man. This is the Jesus now. This is the Jesus that John saw in heaven as the same Jesus you and I will see. He wasn't a little baby. John's recount of this meeting was detailed in that very first chapter of Revelation when he wrote, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to his feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And here it is, per John. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. John continued describing his interaction with Jesus, with Jesus' reaction. He placed his right hand on me, saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. No more would I expect you to remember me on my birthday as an infant. And I would expect that you would look at Jesus as no longer being a perpetual infant as he is on his birthday. Despite what the world would have you believe, Jesus Christ is alive today, a full-grown man, and he is ready to come again. That defenseless baby in the manger stands now at the ready, holding the keys to death, hell, and the grave, awaiting the Father's command to come again. And when his command comes, John wrote in the 19th chapter of Revelation how Jesus would appear. John wrote, I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judge and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies, 
which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. John seeing Jesus with this heavenly army getting ready to come. He did not see a baby in a manger. When he first seen Jesus in heaven, he did not see a baby in a manger. He's seen a full grown man. These holidays now that we have, it feels like the world has tried to emasculate Jesus Christ into just a tiny infant, a perpetual baby. And people do not see, they do not see that that is not a portrayal of what is truly alive today. And here we stand. The baby in the manger had an attempt made on his life. Male children to and under were killed instead, becoming, as I see it, the first martyrs for the cause of Christ. Jesus survived and went to the cross as the ultimate sacrifice for sin. Ascending to heaven, he lives still. We know what he looks like today. We know what he will look like in the last days. This holiday season, remember the birth of the Lord. Remember the baby in the manger. But also, remember that day that a new king was born. This king brought with him the payment for sin coursing through his very veins. He laid that payment down in full on that wooden cross for those that believe on a hill called Calvary. And he now stands ready to usher in the new Jerusalem and ushering in that could begin very soon. The baby born into jeopardy. The baby born with a price on his head. The baby that every Christmas season is pictured in his swaddling clothes, in that manger. Now, amen, brothers and sisters, sits upon his throne. Amen. Kneel before the King of Kings. Cry out in repentance to the Lord of all lords. For as Isaiah wrote, for a child will be born to us, and he was. A son will be given to us, and he was. And the government will rest on his shoulders, in his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with a justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. For we have to remember, for on that day, as we see visualized every Christmas season, there was a baby in the city of David that was born for us, a Savior who now stands at the ready, who is no longer an infant, a Savior who is. Christ the Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.